chapter 1. The text will be found in verses 76 to verse 79. title of the message this morning is the day spring to those in darkness. The day spring to those who sit in darkness. Verse 76, this is Zechariah speaking, he says, And thou, child, shalt be called the prophet of the highest. For thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare His ways, to give knowledge of salvation to His people by the remission of their sins, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now, in this chapter, these words of Zechariah, the father of John the Baptist, he's the one that spoke these words. Now, if you remember the, the story of this, the history of this, it was the angel Gabriel was sent of God to Zechariah. He was sent to prophesy of the birth of John the Baptist. He told him in this prophecy that he would be used of God to turn Israel to the Lord their God. That he would go before the Lord and God he would go before his God in the power of Elijah and prepare the way of the Lord. But you know this, because of his unbelief, he was given that dumb spirit. He was, he was made dumb and unable to speak until the birth of his son. And now, in our text, he speaks. He speaks praise to God. Look at this in verse 67. Being filled, being 60, 67, he said, Being filled with the Holy Ghost, he prophesied, saying, Bless, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he hath visited and redeemed his people. He hath raised up an horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant, David. He's praising God for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the more power of God's salvation for Israel. That he should come from the house of David. He said, you've not forgotten the house of David. Remember, that's the lineage in which Christ should come. And hath raised up, uh, in verse 70, and he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which had been since the world began, that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all them that hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember His holy covenant. He praises God for the remembrance of the covenant of grace that He made with Abraham. That Israel should be saved that they should dwell in holiness and righteousness before Him. And then in our text, now, He turns to His child, this infant, and He speaks to His, his child in verse 76, and He says, And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare His way. Now listen, he wasn't talking to his son. His son could not understand him. His son could not receive what he was saying. He was prophesying to all those that were gathered there. He was prophesying concerning the work that God gave John. 
he was prophesying concerning the office that John the Baptist was to hold. And that was to be the, the last prophet in Israel and the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll tell you what, this man was blessed. This man was blessed with an office that no other man had ever had. Before or since, he was chosen for this one purpose, to be the forerunner of the Lord Jesus Christ. He was to be the prophet of God and the preacher of the gospel to Israel. Now, there are many people who preach the gospel before. But none preached it with such clarity and revelation as John did. Why? Because he came right before the Lord Jesus Christ. He went before him declaring he was come. And when he came to him that day to be baptized, he declared this is the one. This is the one who was preferred before me and was before me. The Lamb of God. In Matthew chapter 3 it says, For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying the voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord and make his paths straight. What is a forerunner? forerunner in this day was when a king would go into a country he desired to go into a country and he would send an ambassador he would send a man to make preparation for his visit he would make it known to all those in the country the king was coming so that that state or that country should make preparation for him and his visit they should bow before him, that they should sing his praises. And this is what John was sent to do. He was sent as a forerunner to the king of kings. The long-expected prophet of Israel was imminently to come. And John was the one declaring this. John was the one sent to say, He's coming, He's coming, He's here. He's here. The king is here. And he was to prepare, look at that, he was to prepare his ways. Prepare his ways. What does this mean? It means he was to preach. He was to declare the message of what the Messiah was come to accomplish. And look at his ways. This is the way of the Messiah. This is what he was sent to preach. He was sent to preach to give knowledge of salvation unto his people. Jesus Christ, friends, is the knowledge of salvation. No man, without knowing Christ, you cannot be saved. He is the knowledge of salvation. Sent to give knowledge which is not natural. It's not natural. Salvation by grace is not the natural thought of man. The natural thought is to merit salvation. That's the natural thought. But the thought of true salvation, the knowledge of true salvation, is grace, mercy. That he must purchase redemption. Look at that, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of sins. We must preach the cause of such salvation. The remission of sins, and we know this, we'll see this, that the remission of sins is not by any way but blood. You can't have remission of sins without blood. That the knowledge of salvation then is through the death of the Son of God. Isn't that what John preached? Behold, what? The Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That's what John was to preach. 
He said, Behold, the Lamb, the knowledge of salvation, Jesus Christ. And by the remission of sins comes salvation. Behold the Lamb of God, which beareth away the sin of the world. And what is the cause that he is to preach? What is the, the, the uh, source of this salvation? Look at verse 78. Through the tender mercy of our God. In other words, this is by the grace of God. This salvation, knowledge of salvation, by the remission of sins through the blood of Christ, is through the tender mercy of God alone. The tender mercy of God. What's the proof of God's tender mercy? I know how the world views as tender mercy. They say, well, if I've got food and I've got clothes and I've got money and I've got fame, and I, that, that shows God loves me. No, that's not true. That person doesn't have any knowledge at all about salvation. The proof of God's salvation is this. Look at verse 78. Whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us. This is how we may prove the love of God. For God so loved the world, what? That He gave His only begotten Son. This is the proof of God's love, of His tender mercy, is that He sent His Son. And notice who He sent His Son for. To what for He sent Him for? To give life. To them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now, it is my intention by the Lord this morning to look at these verses a little more closely. I know I've given you an overview of them, but I want them to, I want them to ring true in our hearts because I believe every believer in Christ can identify with what John was sent to preach. Everybody that is a believer in Christ can identify with this message. We know this to be true. And this is what we're to preach as, as the church of Jesus Christ. We are sent into the world with the same message that John was given. And so then I want to see this in four different points. i got four points for us. Very simply, just questions. Who are we to preach to? Those who sit in darkness. Second of all, who gives light to those who sit in darkness? The day spring on high. He hath visited us to what? Give light to them that sit in darkness. Thirdly, what is the purpose of the day spring? He is sent, but He is sent to what? Give light. The knowledge of salvation by the remission of sins. And what is the source of all of this mercy given to those who sit in darkness? Through the tender mercies of God. This is the source of of all our salvation, the tender mercies of God. So then, to whom do we preach? Those who sit in darkness. Now, who are these that sit in darkness? This morning, I want to preach to those who sit in darkness. Now, if you believe or you're, you've seen the light and God's given you the light, you can identify with those who sit in darkness, can't you? You understand what it is to sit in darkness. And so then we preach to those who sit in darkness under the shadow of death. Now, who are they? The Scriptures are plain and clear, and they state this, that man by nature, the spiritual nature of all man, without exception, we are born completely and perfectly dead in sin. Dead, my friend, is dead. There is no greater darkness than to be dead. What Solomon said, a dead man knoweth nothing. 
He's dead. He's dead. He can feel nothing. He can love nothing. He can touch nothing. And nothing that touches him will affect him at all. He is dead. This is what the Scripture speaks of us naturally. No man therefore naturally knows God, nor does any man understand the righteousness of God, nor can any man obtain righteousness by his actions. He is completely, spiritually dead and in darkness. And this is because we are plunged into the very depths of sin in which there is no light at all. We naturally sit in complete and utter darkness. I was uh, went on vacation up there in Tennessee and went into this cave. They have these, these, this big cave that you can go in and explore. And they have lights in there that you can see. And you go in and see all of the, 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 the markings on the cave and, and how this eroded. They take us into the, the very depth of this cave, the very center of this cave. And they shut out the light. Listen, I've been in darkness before, but I don't think I've ever been in that kind of darkness. Literally, you could not see your hand in front of your face. You could not see anything. And I tell you, there's a there's a fear, there's a panic, there's a, a a sense where you can feel the darkness. But how much more in darkness is the na- is the natural state of man? God said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form and void. And listen. Darkness covered the face of the deep. That is God's first illustration of our human nature. Without form and void, darkness covers. Darkness. And listen, we are under the shadow of death. Under the shadow of death. Man knows he must physically die. But surely to him it is only a shadow of what's to come. It's only a shadow of the dread and fear that will overcome his soul in the face of eternal justice. No man could ever know or feel this darkness or the shadow of God's justice looming over his soul, unless God teach him. I can tell you this, and I can tell you this, and I can tell men this, but they will never understand it. They will never know it in themselves unless God gives them understanding. I don't can't tell you, I'm sure that there are many people who have all of this knowledge of depravity in their mind, but have never felt it in their hearts. They've never known it for themselves. They know all men are depraved, but they don't know themselves to be depraved. And I ask the Lord God that He would reveal that to every one of us. You know what? I know, I've I've known that I've sat in darkness, but I surely don't know the full depths of it. I don't know the full depth from which Christ has saved me. Do you? We must be taught this. For only those who sit in darkness is this promise of light given. Do you realize that? Only those who know the darkness are promised to give light. 
He gives light to those who sit in darkness. You know, only the dead need to be raised. And only the sinner needs salvation. And only God can reveal it. By nature, we are ignorant of this darkness. In fact, even in our blindness, what do we say? Well, I see. Isn't that what we say? Isn't that what religious men say? How dare you suppose that I'm lost? How dare you preach to me as though I'm, I'm in darkness? Isn't that the same attitude the Pharisees had? Go over to John chapter 9. Look at, look at this and tell me not this is the same, not the same attitude. John chapter 9. Look at verse 39. Remember Jesus healed that man that was born blind. What a picture of salvation that is. And in verse 39, Jesus said this, For judgment I am come into this world. What does this mean? He said, I've come to satisfy judgment. I've come for judgment. And you know he was judged of God under, under the curse when God made him to be sin for us. God, his justice, his judgment fell on him and judgment was satisfied in Christ. For what purpose? Here it is. That they which see not might see. And that they which see might be made blind. And some of the Pharisees which were with him heard these words and said to him, Are we blind also? Are you saying we're blind? Are you saying we're sitting in darkness? Is that what you're telling us? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you should have no sin. But now you say, we see. Therefore, your sin remains. Your sin remains. Oh, friends, Jesus came to give sight to one particular group of people. Those who sit in darkness. Those who have no light in themselves. Those who cannot produce any light by their works or by their actions. And only those who sit in darkness. Now listen, I like this. To sit implies some measure of understanding. They're not lying in darkness. They're sitting in darkness. They're sitting in... It implies some knowledge of the darkness. Have you ever been made to feel your darkness? The darkness of your sin. Are you blind? Naturally blind? Or do you say, I see. Are you made sensible for your need? And what is light? Light is a picture of righteousness. Light is a picture of holiness. Light is a picture of love and warmth and grace and mercy. Do you need those things? You are if you sit in darkness. You need light. And darkness is a picture of shame and guilt and death and gloom and pain and sorrow. Do you sit in those things? Do you need light? The gospel that John was to be was to preach is to those who feel their sense of darkness and sin in some measure need light. Are you in such gloom and darkness? Are you ignorant of God and His righteousness? And listen, stop groping in the dark. This is what religion's doing. He's telling you to grope in the dark. 
Maybe God will be satisfied if you do this. Maybe God will be satisfied if you do that. Maybe God will be happy if you just stop doing this and start doing that. Religion is groping in the dark. I'm not here to grope in the dark. I'm here to show you life. I'm here to tell you that there is something, rather someone, God is satisfied with. Jesus Christ. So if you're in the dark, stop groping and sit down. Why? Because light comes to those who sit in darkness. Not work in darkness. Those who cease from working, cease from striving, who know their need. And once God gives you a need, you'll begin to see some things. You'll begin to see the difference between true and false religion. You'll begin to see something is different about the gospel as opposed to the, what the world preaches. You'll begin to see there's something different about this message. You may not fully yet understand what's different about it, but you, you get a sense. When God's ready to say, hey, they get a sense that this gospel's different. Well, this gospel doesn't depend upon you in any measure, but depends solely upon God, upon Christ, upon His finished work, and nothing you do can be added to His work. That's different than the religious world. That's different. And those who are made aware of their darkness, they begin to see that all of their religion is vain. All of their, their works are empty. And they begin to feel a sense of their gift. Their sorrow over sin. You remember that's what he did to Gomer and Hosea, right? You remember that this was a picture... Gomer is a picture of us. Her name means wasted. She was a prostitute. She had married that uh, Hosea had taken her as his, as his wife and loved her as God did us. But by nature, we like Hosea forsook God. And yet, even though she left him, Hosea kept putting those gifts outside her door. And she thought that it was her lovers doing that. And one day he said this. He said, I'm going to take away those gifts. I'll take away her wine and her bread and I'll take away the mirth of her feast and I'll, I'll crush her gods. Isn't this what God did to us? He took away the mirth of our sin. Sin is no longer what it was. Come ashes in our mouth. Now why did He do this? He said, Behold, I will allure her. You see, in order for you to appreciate light, you must first sit in darkness. If you've never sat in darkness, you've never seen the light. Someone always said, tells me this. Uh, I usually run into people. They'll say, well, I've been saved all my life. And I always say, that's too long. If you've never been lost, you've never been found. If you've never been dead, you've never been raised. If you've never sat in darkness, you've never seen the light. This is to whom we preach, those who sit in darkness, that God may reveal their darkness, their need of Christ, that He may crush the mirth of their sins and show that death is solemn. You are sitting under the shadow of death. You that sit in darkness... I'm here to tell you you are under the shadow of God's justice. Spurgeon, preaching on the immutability of God, said this, that every threatening, every threatening of God, as well as every promise, shall be filled. I will tell you of a decree of God that shall not change. He that believeth not shall be damned. That is a decree of God that is changeless. Listen, if you will not come to Christ, you will read, Spurgeon said, you shall read those words in fire as the ages roll by. Shall be damned. And those in hell say, I am damned. And yet the words st still read, shall be damned. You're sitting in the shadow of death. 
friends, this is not a trivial thing. Gospel preaching is not trivial. Hell is very real. But I'm here to tell you of the grace of God. Because those who sit in darkness, I like this, are under the shadow of death. Why? Because all that God will give light to, death is nothing more than a shadow. It's nothing more than a shadow. Like an eclipse, it only darkens the sun for a time. But what happens when the eclipse is over? The sun shines in his strength. And that's what God promises to those. You sitting in darkness, here's a promise. He will give light by one source. Look at your text, the day spring. He said, whereby the day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sat in darkness. Who is this day spring? Who is it that gives light to those who sit in darkness? It is only Jesus Christ. He is the day spring from on high who visited us. He is the Son of God, the eternal Son of God. God, very God, and yet God, very God, who is in Himself light, what? Visited us. Oh, this means that God became man. God condescended to take upon Himself our human nature. Jesus Christ is the day spring. This is what we're to preach to those who sit in darkness. Look, the day is dawn. Jesus Christ is the day spring that gives light to all His people who sit in darkness. For God hath made Him alone to be the surety of an everlasting covenant. Therefore, He has come into the world from heaven to be our representative. To do for those who sit in darkness what they could not and would not do for themselves. Jesus Christ, he says, for by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. And I tell you, when he came into the world, what, how did he find it? Did he not find it in darkness? He found it in complete darkness. All of those promises that God had given to the nation of Israel, they were only shadows. They were only pictures. But what happened when Christ came into the world? It is though the sun had risen, and all the shadows were forced to flee. All of the pictures of the old covenant became living and enlightened. You know, I can read the Old Testament and see it just as clearly. How is that? Because the day spring has come. Christ has risen and fulfilled all of the prophecies that were spoken of Him. And so we look back, and this is why Paul said that we, God had, uh, God had given us better things, prepared better things for us than those who went before us. Jesus Christ is this day spring by which we may have what? The knowledge of salvation. This is what the day spring has come to do. He has come to give knowledge of salvation. What's the first thing we know? We sit in darkness. We know our need of Him and then the light of the gospel of Christ shines in our hearts as God commands it to give us what? The light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Only when the gospel light shines in the power of the Spirit do we actually have light. Life. Righteousness. Peace. Joy. These are the things that Christ came to give. Who came to give. How should He give these things to us who sit in darkness? By the remission of sins. 
by his death on the cross. That's how he comes. He gives us the light of who we are, but he gives us the light of what he's done, what he's finished, his work. And so then you who sit in darkness, do you need light? I'm giving you light. I am setting forth the light. That's what John was here to do. He said, Behold, the Lamb of God that beareth the way the sin of the world. What does every preacher since John do? We do the same thing. You who sit in darkness, behold the light. Behold the light. That's what Elijah, uh, Ezekiel was commanded to do. He said, Preach to dead bones. Okay. Okay. You know what you're going to do. I'm just going to preach. That's what we do. We just preach. And we say, look, you blind, see the light. I have no power to give you sight. But I know this, the day spring will give you light. Oh, when the light shines out of darkness, is it not the most wonderful, joyous thing? I remember when I was in the service, we would spend all night in the field cold damp dark there was nothing more precious than when the sun rose in the morning and the warmth of the sun kissed your face there was nothing it was beautiful it was glorious how much more glorious is it when the sun of righteousness rises up in your heart and you, you're able to see. See what? The remission of my sins by the death of the Son. You see, my sins are gone. And what's the, what's the, uh, the cause? What's the root cause that we're to give for this? John, go and preach. Prepare the way of the Lord. Preach to those who sit in darkness that the day spring will give them light, that He will give them knowledge of salvation by the remission of sins. And what is the cause, Lord? Here it is in verse 78. Through the tender mercies of our God. This is the cause of all salvation, the tender mercies of God. If God ever touches you with the light, if he ever kisses your soul with light and life, it is through his tender mercies he does. The psalmist says of God's people, we have thought of thy loving kindness. Isn't that what we're doing today? Aren't we thinking of his loving kindness? thinking of Him and the purpose that He had to save us. We're thinking of His Son and the great salvation, the great sacrifice that He had made by His one offering for sin. And you remember what He did when He offered that one sacrifice? He sat down. You sit in darkness, I'm pointing you to the light. And I'm telling you, He sat down. He's finished the work come to the light it is shining for thee and sweetly the light has dawned upon me once I was blind now I can see but Christ is the light of the world Christ is the light and life of my soul can you identify with that does that not pluck the string of your heart? I'm thankful. Be thankful if it does. Rejoice. Rejoice. You that once sat in darkness have seen what? A great light. A great light. I pray God will bless you.